So I would like to talk to you about uh, an N-body simulation. Um, and I named the talk uh, N-bodies trying to be fast because that's actually what I tried to do most of the time. I had this N-body simulation. I just tried to make it fast. And there are various ways of, of how you can do optimizations. And uh, many of them resort around changing the actual algorithm. So um, you employ different computations, you use different data structures that have different behavior. But I mostly try to retain the behavior of my program. So um, I'm using the, the same computations. So I'm running the same, I, I just like combine the numbers in the same way. I produce the same results. I'm just trying to play with how data is put into memory, just the way data is layouted and look at how that affects uh, programs. So it's, it's kind of like uh, an aggregation of like little stories of little tales of different memory layouts and how they performed and, and what were the observations. And I was trying to do that for CPU and GPU. And we'll talk about the GPU part maybe in another seminar. Let, let's see how far we get. I have a lot of slides. So they're around like 80 slides. Um, I don't know how long this talk will take. Uh, I have a lot of background information on most of the stuff I present. I didn't put everything on the slide because I took a week to prepare the slides and I ran out of time eventually. So there's still more that you can always ask in between. Um, so basically feel free to ask any questions, ask some background information. Um, this is a continuation of my talk on Llama that I gave in uh, on the 8th of October this year. And if you haven't seen that there's, there should be a recording at YouTube eventually. Uh, it's not there yet, I've seen. So Casus tries to put all the seminars on on YouTube, but I think there are only three of them of, of, of Attila yet and, and one external speaker. By the way, can you hear background noise here in my room? Because I have a radiator next to me because it's cold. <laughs> can you hear that? No, no, the sound is fine. The sound is fine. Great, because then I can keep warm. Perfect. <laughs> so. As I said, we will take a simple n-body simulation to play with various memory layouts uh, with and without Llama. Why without Llama? Because uh, it was also kind of an exercise for me to try how good Llama is. So how like how good the memory layouts and also the code that is generated from uh, from from an n-body where I would use Llama to do the layout thing. So eventually Llama tries to be a, a library that can do all this layouting stuff for me. So I don't need to do it myself. So I can just switch the layout easily around. But there's a lot of magic to achieve this. So I wanted to figure out is like all the magic that does the layout, is that going away during compilation? And is the optimal, is the result that's produced optimal? So that's why I also tried uh, like writing those layouts manually. As I said, I, I don't do functional changes. I just play with data layout and caching. And yeah, there, there will be a lot of assembly. So I'm, I'm sorry for those that, that hate uh, instructions and that like super low level uh, CPU stuff, because you, you're going to see a lot of that. Something completely different for a starter. So somebody made me aware of this. Um, no, I'm actually kidding. I wrote it myself. So I, I was so frustrated and in COVID lockdown, I decided to write a book. And this book actually contains the, the first chapter of my PhD thesis. Uh, it's, 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 it's called Llama Destroys the World. So this is where we're trying to go. Uh, I see Michael with joined. distinction with that one, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm having super high hopes. It's available, available on Amazon. You can, uh, you can already buy it. Uh, yeah, the, just check it out. So you want to have a like the early results of my PhD thesis, you, you're going to find them there. I, I will call you Heather Fox for the for the rest <laughs> of your PhD thesis. You know? ah, that's my artist name. Don't don't, don't tell <laughs> <Very> anyone. <laughs> this this really nicely augments the apocalypse shirts. Yeah, it's 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 just great. Okay, so uh, the n-body simulation I'm looking at is a time step simulation of particles with mass that move in space. So each particle is a point in 3D space. They have a mass, they have a position, they have a velocity. And we just run a number of time steps in a loop. And for each of uh, the particles, which we call P1, we go over each of the other particles again, call them P2. And then we update the velocity of P1 based on the influence of P2 
So we take like both particles position, we measure the distance, we look at the mass of the other particle, and then we compute how much does that impact P1, and then we update the velocity of P1, given the time step. So we have two nested loops, and that's actually where most of the time is spent in this, in this little program I, I will show you in a minute. And this is what we're trying to optimize mostly, like where those particles are stored and, and how P1, P2 are pulled out of memory and put back again. There is a second step in such a simulation it's, uh, where we go over all the particles again and update the position um, of the particle P depending on its velocity. So we like move the, the, the velocity information that we, that we ac accumulated in the velocity, we move it into the position. But that part is just ON runtime complexity. You just go over all the particles. Uh, that costs like almost nothing compared to the, the, the squared iteration of the particles. So we just focus on the squared iteration of particles. Okay, I'll show you the baseline version. So, so this is like uh, a naive version with some optimizations on top. So this is something that uh, I would write several years ago before I knew better. <clears throat> and that's basically uh, like the relevant parts of the code. Can you read that? Is that large enough? Not that I can do anything about it. It's like, I can't zoom into it, <laughs> but is it, is it big enough? Okay, great. So I'll walk you through it quickly. Uh, at the very left top, I, I think Zoom supports this mouse cursor thing. So you should see that mouse cursor. So I'll, I'll just declare a, a type alias called FP. We'll see that a couple of times and it's float. So whenever you see FP, it's just the float. The reason why I'm doing this is I could potentially turn the benchmark into a version that uses double precision by changing it here. I didn't do that though, but it's just a way where I, where, where I could switch the, the, the data type. Then we have a vector that just has uh, three floats, that's x, y, and c. We have a particle that consists of a vector, so x, y, and c, that we call position. We have the same for velocity, and then we have a float that's called mass. So this particle consists of seven floats. It has a position x, y, c, velocity x, y, c, and mass. And for the base version, we just create a std vector of those and uh, we allocate a lot of them and those are problem size many. And in most of my benchmarks, this problem size is somewhere around uh, 16,000 or 64,000. So that's like roughly the domain we can compute in a few seconds. On the right side on the bottom, we have this update routine. So this is what does like the, the two nested loops. We go over all the particles and all over all the particles again. And we always fetch one particle and the other. So this like gets to get all the, the, the pairs of particle in, 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 my, in my vector of particles. And then I call PP interaction, which is the particle particle interaction. And what this does is what we can see here on top. We have this particle i, that's the one that's going to be updated. We see it here at the very bottom. We update the velocity of this particle. And there is pj, which is the other particle that influences pi. Uh, and here we have the computation that we are doing. And it doesn't matter so much what it's doing exactly, but this is just like number crunching. So we compute something here. So concretely, we take the difference uh, between the two positions, so, and we do something on the distance. Um, eventually we take the mass of one of the particles, do some multiplication, eventually we update the velocity. So what, what comes into the computation is the, dist, uh, the, the positions of both particles, the mass of one particle, we update the velocity of the other. That's what's being done here. Okay. Um, I put it up in Godbolt, which is a, a super cool website if you if you didn't know that, and I'm going to switch over to, to, to that one. And I've used it in a couple of talks before. It basically shows you the assembly that's generated for your code. And uh, so I'm already sorry, actually I'm not sorry because everybody should be a little familiar with assembly because it's, it's quite good to look at that uh, once in a while to see what the machine is actually doing. So it's super nice that we can write those fancy expressions here on the, on the left, but this here on the right is what the machine actually executes. So this is what at the end, what consumes our power, what, what gets our computations done. So it, it's quite good to be aware of what's happening here. So I'm quickly showing you here on the update routine. That's again, the same we saw on the slides here. And here on the right, that's the code that's generated. So that's like roughly 
46 lines of assembly. So, so nothing super fancy. And the reason I'm showing this to you is because this gives you more of a feeling what's actually happening on the, on the CPU. So what we can see here is at the very top, we, we have this routine update. We don't see PP interaction on the right side because the compiler inlined that. It just put the implementation of PP interaction into update and then it ran optimizations. We can also see here two labels, L3 and L2. And at the bottom, you have two jumps. So there's jump to L1 and jump to L3. So those are the loops that we have here. And everything in between here, that's computation. So that's computation that runs, then we do a comparison and we jump back up again, and then we rerun the comparison, uh, the, the, the computation. So this here just uh, are, are the two loops here. And this is everything here in between, that's computation. And we can see here at the beginning, there are some memory fetches. So this is where we load the two positions of the particles. Then we do a lot of multiplications, additions, multiplications. And then we have this interesting instruction here in the middle, that's R square root. And R square root is a uh, particularly interesting instruction because it, con it computes the reciprocal sp square root. I'm sorry I'm distracted here because my cats just went mad and run around weirdly. I think they're afraid of the radiator. So I'm turning that on here, uh, turning it off here. Hopefully I have more quiet uh, in the background now. So this is R square root. It, it basically computes uh, one over the square root of something because it turns out that this is quite slow to compute because it, it contains a division and a square root. So at some point, uh, Intel decided they make an instruction for it. I'll talk about that a little later. But then more multiplication and additions, and eventually we do something that's called a fused multiply add, which is basically just another multiplication and addition, but put together in one instruction. Okay, so this is like, we'll, we will look at variations of those uh, over the course of the talk. But uh, also interesting to note is here, all these instructions have a prefix V. That means those are so-called vector instructions, but they have as a suffix SS, which stands for a scalar and single precision. So single precision makes sense. We're using floats here. And scalar means that although this is a vector instruction, it will just work on a single floating point value because the compiler did not vectorize the code here. And we'll talk about vectorization in a bit. Are there any questions so far? Have you got a rough idea of what's happening here? I have a small question. If Please go. Want better you. Um, <laughs> the particle particle interaction just updates one particle, but yes. the third axiom of Newton says that both particles need to be updated, isn't it? Yes. So uh, you, we could, uh, in theory, uh, in particle particle interaction, compute the interaction of, of, of each particle onto each other so we can compute the two. Like, say that you're actually right because interaction actually implies it affects both particles. But you're right, this is kind of asymmetric because it only updates one of the particles. But since we have two nested loops that iterate over all of the particles, those the role of P1 and P2 at some point in the, in the iterations, those will swap. So, so what, what had been particle one at some point will be particle two and vice versa. So eventually after running all of these, you will have the interactions uh, back and forth, but it's true that a single invocation of this PP interaction just updates one particle. Okay, I understand, thank you. Yeah. Good, let's switch back to the slides. So I didn't discuss the flags in particular that I used for compilation. I list them here for you to, to know what's happening. Uh, a few mentions to that. Uh, when you when you compile and you run real code, please do so with optimizations. I've seen that too often that people actually run the bug builds and complain that they take very long. Then here we have a couple of instructions that affect the generated instructions. So here I turn on AVX2, which is an instruction set for vectorization that CPUs have for several years now. Sorry. So it's pretty safe that, that your CPU already supports that. Then we can turn on FMA, uh, which enables this fused multiply add instructions. And there is a flag called Arch Native. By the way, all of these are, are compiler flags for GCC and Clang. But since most of you work uh, on Linux, that, that should be uh, what you will see and use. And MArch Native basically lets the compiler ask the machine, what do you support? And then it enables instructions that your CPU supports based on where you compile it. 
So it might be possible then if you take the executable, you put it on, on a different computer that it doesn't work so good there. Or, or that you actually get a problem because uh, the executable has an instruction that the target CPU doesn't support. But those are the flags uh, uh, I use. And then there are a couple of flags that affect uh, mathematics. So um, you can make promises to the compiler, for example. None of your computations will produce NANDs or, or infinite values. Or if one of the math functions, for example, square root, we, we call square root in our program. So if square root fails, uh, it's required to set a global error variable called error no. So this is the side effect that takes a little extra time and it disturbs the compiler in optimizing uh, your code. So you can turn it off so your compiler has a better chance of, of optimizing your code. You can also enable like unsafe mathematical optimizations. And uh, those are optimizations that uh, break what the IEEE uh, asks um, or requires a compiler to do with floats. Then the compiler is free to like, like, like turn around uh, um, operands. For example, if you compute uh, A times B, that's not necessarily the same than B times A, for example. So like the order of evaluation uh, of your operands, those matter. And the IEEE requires the compiler to, to do it strictly as you have written. So you can relax that a, a bit here. And finally, there is fast math, which also some people sometimes turn on. This is a combination of the, of the upper three plus some more flags. And those can get you in a little danger because at some point, uh, the precision of your program is going to be reduced. And uh, that's sometimes not what you want because sometimes it's still important that your results are precise. So, so be wary that that can degrade your precision, but it also gives you performance. So specifically, we, uh, we have seen FMA in R square root. Uh, there's a little bit more information here, but I think we, we covered most of it. So, so FMA is just the combined instruction that computes uh, A times B plus C. You can explicitly call that in code. There is an intrinsic for that that's called MMFMATSS. But usually a compiler recognizes this and you just pass the flag and hi, uh, please go off the table. My cat just jumped up here. Um, so yeah, uh, if you look at your assembly, you see fused multiply adds, that's good. Uh, the reciprocal square root, it computes a one over square root of X uh, and it it's faster if your compiler uses that instruction, but it also gives you less precision. And it's quite interesting uh, when the compiler generates an R square root instructions, it usually always generates a Newton Refson refinement of the result after the R square root instruction. So this was a super surprise to me. So because I saw whenever the compiler used R square root, there were more multiplications and add after the instruction. So, so I read a little bit up of what compilers do here. And actually because the precision of R square root is so bad, compilers generate this extra code that just does like one Newton step to refine the result. And that, then, then it's quite okay to precision. But R square root is still much faster. Even with the Newton step, it's faster than just computing the division and the square root itself. By the way, does anyone remember Quake's famous uh, fast inverse square root? Great, some, some, somebody raised their, uh, great, great. So the reason why people wrote that back in the time was because they also saw that the division and the square root took an awful lot of time. So they came up with very creative ways on how to complete compute this one over square root of, of some number. And that's a, a version that you could find in Quake back then. Uh, and it's faster than actually doing the division and the square root. You shouldn't use that anymore nowadays because uh, there is a specific R square root instructions, but back in the time people used to do this. Uh, I don't explain you exactly how it works. Uh, you can read that up on the internet, but it's pretty interesting and the backstory how people came up with that. So eventually, where does that get us? Uh, the, those compiler flags. So uh, running this uh, particle simulation on, on uh, 65,000 particles and, and doing one single call of the update routine that takes around 10 seconds uh, with, with uh, maximum optimization level. So if we add those various flags, we enable AVX2 instructions and fused multiply add. So that like gives us a 10%. 10 so that's uh, mostly the, the fused multiply adds. Then we can add some math flags and, and those like also give us like 5% like more roughly. But this is like the span that we have by tweaking compiler flags. So we get around 10, 15% out here 
uh, by by re making the compiler reduce the precision and by using better instructions. But we're still doing the same computations. So that's the baseline. So that's the, the base algorithm on, on which I'm, I'm trying to improve. And here for complete list, that's the memory layout that this base version uh, uses. And the way you, you you need to read that is that memory starts at the left top and it goes to the right. So those are like increasing memory addresses. And after 64 bytes, we wrap around and start a new line. So the memory just goes like, like you would read a, a piece of text. <clears throat> and I've chosen the width to be 64 bytes. That's the width of one cache line. So we can, so we know that whenever the computer accesses memory, when the CPU makes a memory request, usually cache lines are pulled into the into the processor. So whenever we fetch one value, let's see, like here, the item 19 position Y, when we fetch that value, the memory bus actually transfers the whole line here. But we actually only use one value out of that. So that should already give you a, a hint on where we can try to improve stuff by by making when we ask for memory, like put more values into this that are, that are interesting. Okay, cool. That brings us to our first uh, alternative memory layout, which is a struct of arrays. And for struct of arrays, we have uh, two possibilities on, on, on how we can uh, have those in our program. So basically struct of arrays, it means that we put uh, the particle struct that we had we put arrays into this particle struct. So instead of an array of particles, which have like one position X, one position Y and so forth, we just have one struct particle that has like all the X values inside. And then it has all the Y values and all the C values. So this is where the name comes here, struct of arrays. And this is the memory layout, how it looks like. And as I said, there are two ways so we can put this into one single chunk. So we make one memory allocation for all these values, or we can make seven memory allocations and put just each of the arrays in a, in a separate memory uh, block. And this surprisingly has a difference. We will see that later. So both of these layouts are still constructive arrays, but the one uses one allocation, the other one uses seven allocations. How does it look in code? So in code, we now need to do, I'll, I'll do the seven allocation version here. So we create the, instead of one vector, we create seven vectors. And here's a little detail I'm using. Oh yeah, that kind of belongs to, to the upper line. Sorry for the bad formatting. So it still uses a std vector, but it's using an allocator that just makes sure that this block of memory is put somewhere on an address that's a multiple of 64. So if we go back to the memory layout here, the beginning of this block, it starts at an address that's a multiple of 64. So that's important later for vectorization. But basically we have our seven chunks of memory. And you can see here when we write those update routines and those interactions routines, uh, those get nastier because now we don't have a single chunk of memory that we pass around. We pass around seven chunks of memory. Also the argument passing gets nastier, but, but we can do it. It's a little bit more code but that's the, the AOS version. So quick look at vectorizations. So CPU, I've, I've shown you before, you have these vector instructions and those vector instructions have the ability to run on multiple uh, numbers at the same time. So if you have a computation like this one, where we, and we run this computation on arrays. So we have an array B, C, D, and A, and we just like have a loop over all of those, then, um, the CPU is actually able to fetch eight values or 16 values and depends specifically on the instruction set. It's uh, capable of fetching several of those values and just runs multiple of those computations at the same time. And very nicely, this doesn't cost any extra time. So when the CPU does a single add instruction or multiplication instruction like here, whether it does it on one or eight value, it costs the same time. It's not true true again if you do it on 16 because like some of the instruction then, then start to like slow down the frequency of the processor but like with those eight instructions most of the time those take the same amount of time so the reverse thought is now if we use instruction vector instructions and computations and we just all do them on one element then we're actually wasting a lot of power that our cpu has for computation so here is a benchmark and uh, here we can see already 
the impact of, of using and not using this extra uh, compute capacity. And I'm running, I'm benchmarking on two machines basically, which is an, an AMD Ryzen 9. That's a fairly new CPU with like 16 cores, I think. So it's a, it's a pretty new and, and, and large machine. And on the right here, we have an Intel core that's also fairly new. It's like, I don't know, a few years older, but it's also a very powerful CPU. And here I have uh, the numbers for you. We, I measured the runtime of a call to update. Uh, in general, it's an average of 10 runs as far as I know. Yeah, it's an average of 10 runs. So like there's some statistic here, so it doesn't chitter too much. And we have the AOS version of Llama that takes around 12 seconds. And we have the AOS version that we wrote by hand, which is like roughly around 10 seconds. But then for the comparisons, we have the struct of array runs and those take around two seconds. And that's really cool because that's like a six time uh, runtime improvement, but just changing the way the data is, is put into memory. And um, I think that's pretty cool. That's pretty amazing. We can also see here that uh, there is destructive array version that uses uh, multiple buffers, multiple blobs. That's what this MB stands for. So this means uh, all the X's are in a separate buffer. All the Y's are in a separate buffer. This is slightly faster than the one that uses a single allocation. And we might have a look at that later. Also on the Intel core, we see there's a similar difference. For some reason, the Llama version uh, of the struct of ARI is considerably slower here. I don't know exactly why. I, I haven't looked into that very much, but overall we can see that the struct of ARI performs far, far better than the ARI of struct. So let's look into a bit of assembly, what, what's going on here. And uh, this is an output from perf. Perf is a super nice uh, command line utility that you can find available on most of your Linux systems. And perf comes uh, with many different sub commands, but uh, what I've used here is the, is the command record and then report. So you call perf record and then you specify an executable and perf just launches that executable and then it will measure um, various kinds of, uh, of, of like performance counters. It, 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 it samples your program. It, it tries to figure out where it spends its time with. And then perf report, it gives you this nice report where it shows you the assembly and where time in your program is spent and it colors it. Uh, so white means there's almost no time spent here. Green is there is moderately amount of time spent here. So I think green is still lower than 5% of your program. And red is everything that's more than 5% of your program time was, was spent running those instructions. If you compile your program with debug information, you can make perf also display your C++ source. Um, but since this is actually fairly short and uh, the, the code we run, and we actually, at least I am interested in the assembly, I, I haven't shown you the source code here. So this is really a pure assembly. So what we see here again, we have the two loops here. We have uh, at the bottom, we have two jump instructions. This is the inner and the outer loop. And those jump here to those two labels that are called 2D and 50. Those are like memory offsets. Those are the two loops. And in between, we have all the, the number crunching. Uh, and we can see the left and the right side. They are kind of similar-ish. But one important difference that we can see here is that the instructions on the right, they have the suffix PS, and this stands for packed single. And packed means this is a vector instructions where all the vector lanes are full of values. They're packed with values. So this means this instruction here will actually make use of the full CPU's capacity and compute on eight numbers. In this concrete case, it's eight floating points. It will use eight floating points in the calculation. Whereas the number, uh, the, the, the variant on the left side, it's a scalar vector instruction, which means it will just run on one number. But otherwise, if you make the comparison, it's pretty similar what, what, what is run here. Exactly. We still have the fused multiply adds in the end and, and so forth. Okay, any questions to this? Okay. Actually, yes, a small one. Yeah, tell me. Uh, what I'm wondering about. So uh, you have, for example, on, on the left-hand side for the array of structs, you have these AVX instructions like the fused multiply add operating actually on uh, SSE register, right? The X XMM yes. ones are SSE registers. 
Yes. And uh, what I'm wondering about, is there actually any performance penalty for using um, AVX commands on SSE registers? There shouldn't be. Um, so uh, maybe also as a side information, uh, as you have observed here, there, the registers here are called XMM. And those are registers that, that were introduced with the SSE instruction sets a long time ago. And on the right side, where we use those packed instructions, we work on the YMM registers. And the way this, this is implemented in the CPU is that the YMM register, it's double the width of the XMM register. And the XMM register is actually the lower half of this YMM register. So they're physically working oh, okay. on, this, on the same circuitry. They're running on the same hardware. So, so both of those commands like talk to the same register, okay. but the ones that use this le legacy register, the names, they just always work on the lower half of the register, but the hardware is doing okay. the same thing. And the instructions like uh, having the vector instruction, the AV, because this really is an AVX instruction and not an SSE instruction, because the SSE instructions, they don't have this V prefix. So if you see a mul SS without the V, that's an SSE instruction. I would, I would argue that the instruction uh, decoder of the CPU would just like see one of those instruction and then just display, uh, dispatch the, the same like micro code to your CPU. So I think it, it, it's handled in the decoder of your CPU and then the CPU will execute the same stuff. That, that's my guess. Okay. Wilhelm, do you know anything more specifically about this? I know you're super aware of all of this. Well, no, I, not more than what you just said. Uh, I think you're on the, uh, you're right there. But it didn't sound so wrong what I said, was it? <laughs> no, no, no. You okay. Right. <laughs> okay. So, so it's our best guess what, what's happening. Yeah. I don't, I don't know like where the interpretation <clears throat> of the instructions actually happen because you know, I'm a physicist, not computer scientist, but I think what you said <laughs> makes sense. Yeah, but cool. That that was that was useful information. I wasn't aware that the that the AVX registers are physically, well, part of them are physically the same as the SSEs. Mm -hmm. Cool. So it's also the same with the AVX 512 registers, which double up the AVX 2 register. They also like just like duplicate the register, and the AVX is the lower half of of this AVX 512 register. And Actually, they are that set is them. not correct because oh. the upper half of the AVX 512 is in a different piece of hardware. Ah, but... oh, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. okay. It okay. works as if it was the lower <laughs> half was uh, was it, it works as if it was like AVX two and SSE four. Okay. okay. So you can see there is still a reason why Gilherm is my supervisor. <laughs> so he's still he's still smarter than me. Cool. Thank you guys. You're welcome. So there's a different utility that, can you, that you can try. And um, I'm sorry for the font being this small. I just tried to give you the, the output uh, pretty much verbatim as you get it out of the command. There's a command perf stat, and that just like runs some statistics. It, it, uh, it samples some performance counters of your hardware. And uh, I took this command, so there's like perf stat dash dd. And I, for a long time, I didn't know what this dd did because I asked Gilham, Gilham, what, what should I run? What's, what's good? And he said, uh, run perfstat dd. So I figured out this d stands for detail. And if you do two d's, it's like detail, detail. And it just gives you more counters. And this is an output here of this perfstat command. And it shows you uh, things like how many context switches occurred in your program, how often did uh, your process migrate to a different CPU, page fault, cycles, instructions, how many branches, how many of those were missed and, and so forth. And there also is like some information on, on the way caches behave. So you can see how many times did your program go to the L1 cache and how often it actually loaded from there and how often it missed the L1 cache. So it tried to pull out the value of the L1 cache and it wasn't there. So this means here the CPU had to stall a bit and go out to like the L2 cache and then to the L3 cache. This is what's called LLC here. That's the last level cache. So that's like the last cache of your CPU before it has to go out into main memory. So those are metrics that you can look at when you want to figure out uh, is my data layout in such a way that the CPU doesn't need to jump back and forth wildly into memory. I'm, am I making good use of my CPU caches? And I highlighted these instructions here because this is where we can see a lot of difference between the AOS and the SOA layout. 
So for example, like the, the, the loads from L1 here, that's like 170 billion. Whereas on the right side, we have a 75 billion. So we only needed to do half of the loads from, from L1. Here we have like 18 billion cash misses, in, cash, miss, cash misses in L1. And here we only have one and a half uh, billion. So that's like, what is that? It's like factor of, of six, something less. And also like loads from the last level cash uh, are like half of them and then cash misses, cash. Oh my God, this is so hard to pronounce. <laughs> cash misses. So, so cash misses on the last level cash are just far lower here on the struct of every version. So we can see clearly that this memory layout had a lot of impact on the way the caches work in our CPU. So the CPU had a far better time of, of reusing data that was residing in the caches. In addition to using vectorization. So not only made, did we make better use of the computational power of the CPU, we also made better use of the memory subsystem. So that's the important takeaway here. Yeah. Remember perf stat, it's, it's, it's really handy. Okay, there's a third layout that I uh, spent considerable time with and that's the array of struct of array. So what the hell is this? And that's a hybrid of the both of them. Because one problem of the uh, struct of arrays is that we, since we put all the X coordinates in one place and all the Y coordinates in a different places, that the information for a single particle, we actually spread it far out in, into memory. So when you want to like, just look at a single particle, you would need to like grab from, from seven different memory locations that are far apart. So the AOSOA tries to bring the information of, of single particles closer together, but retain this kind of, yeah, we put a bunch of them next to each other. So when we, so we can still like, pull out the vectors of those. So it's, it's a hybrid solution of those. And this inner array, so we have an area of structs and then we have this inner array here. So we can configure this inner length. And for this layout here, it's set to eight. So we always block like eight values of the same meaning inside. And then we also have a variant that uh, blocks 16 values uh, inside. So why is this eight and 16? Why are those interesting numbers? So we have already seen uh, AVX2 instructions and those crunch on eight floats. So this is a layout that, that has the inner blocking factor set to what the CPU has as a vector width. So your CPU with AVX2, it crunches on eight floats at the same time. So this is exactly what the CPU vectors would look like. Whereas the layout with 16 inside, that's actually how your caches work because uh, as we've seen on the very first slides, uh, one such line here is exactly one cache line. So we put all the X values here um, together to, to, to just fill an entire cache line. So those are the two layouts I would like to look at. And, and here is the code and, and this changes a bit more. Um, we have this, this lanes factor here that tells us how many inner lanes. Then we have a block of particles and where it is like X, Y, and C and so forth. It's blocked inside here with this with this lanes factor. So with lanes eight, we like inside a particle block, we have eight X, eight Y, eight C in the position and, and then so forth. We still then create a, a vector of those particle blocks, but we don't take the, yeah, and here is something is, is missing. So we don't allocate like N particles if N was the problem size, but we allocate like N by lanes. So if we have, uh, instead of 16,000 particles, we, we allocate only 2,000 of those blocks because each block contains eight of those particles. So there is a little uh, division missing here. But then the update call on the right, we can see that uh, the loop structure changed here. And, and this is interesting for a reason I'll, I'll show you later, because previously we had two loops. We iterated over all the particles from like uh, zero to the number of particles in two loops. But now we need to iterate in two stages. So we iterate over all the number of blocks and the number of blocks, that's the problem size divided by the lanes. So we iterate over all the blocks and then within the blocks, we iterate over all the lanes of this block. So keep in mind that that changed the loop structure here. We now have four nested loops instead of two nested loops. 
But then we pull out uh, those blocks and we run the same PP interaction function again. So that's the same function. Here is the signature. It's the same function that we used for the struct of arrays in the previous memory layout. So that didn't change. So we just changed the blocking of the particles and we changed the loop structure here. But what we crunch, the number crunching, the computations on the on the particle data, that is exactly the same. Uh, I have a question here. Yes. Just uh, I've seen this before, but I, I forgot on asking them. <laughs> I know what you're uh, referring to. <laughs> okay, then guess. It's a Pragma GCC IV DAP. <laughs> okay, so I didn't mention that before, but sometimes we need to help the compiler to vectorize because we need to make promises to the compiler. Because what the compiler sees here when it compiles the code, it, it sees a pointer that goes anywhere into memory. It sees all kinds of looping and those indices changes. And then we compute indices there and like hell, hell is going on here. And the compiler eventually it needs to prove that all those indices and all those memory location, it ends up uh, and, and inside PP interaction, you load data from memory, you store data to memory. So the compiler sees an awful lot of loads and stores going into all different places into memory. The compiler needs to prove that none of those accesses actually overlaps or touches the same memory location. And then it can vectorize. So if the compiler cannot prove that, it cannot guarantee that vectorization would not introduce a different program behavior. So the compiler very often fails to vectorize your code because it cannot make these proofs. And this Pragma GCC IVDEP, IVDEP stands for, that was too fast. Uh, ignore vector dependencies, that was it. So that tells the compi compiler, if you try to vectorize, ignore dependencies. So if you're not sure if there are dependencies between the memory locations, for example, a dependency could be is like one loop iteration writes to the memory and a, a loop iteration later will read from that memory location again. So this is something that the compiler needs to prove that, that all the writes that happen, so we don't read them anywhere later again. So we can like block eight of the loops together and run them vectorized. The compiler needs to prove this. And this helps the compiler by telling it, yeah, if you're not sure if those if those memory uh, accesses are actually free of conflicts, I'm going to give you the promise that they're fine. Like, like, go ahead, do your optimizations. I promise you it's fine. It's also important to know that it makes a difference on where you put this pragma. And I always put the pragma into the right place because I knew. But in reality, you would need to like think about, okay, which is which is the one loop that the compiler is possibly able to vectorize? And this is where you put it. So there is some thinking involved in where you put it. I've also tried putting it on all the loops that usually also works. Yeah, but as I said, like you need to think a little bit about where you place that, but eventually it gives the compiler a guarantee and it makes the compiler vectorize. That's what it does. Sorry for the long explanation. <laughs> Okay, any yeah, more I'm, questions I'm, to this? I'm, I'm, I'm really annoyed about the long explanation. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, really yeah. horrible. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank, thank you very you, much. You, you now stole a lot of time from my seminar. Yeah, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, so how does this perform? And uh, here we have the same two machines again, the, the AMD Ryzen and the Intel Core. I've included the previous benchmarks and I've added uh, four more. So here we have the Llama AOS, the Llama struct of arrays with the multiple buffers. Nope, sorry, that was one too much. And then we have like the area of struct with eight and the area of struct with 16. And we can see like the, the performance is catastrophic. It, it's like just as fast as the area of struct. And that was like super annoying to me. And I figured, wow, I, I was really hoping that that would be better. But when I looked at the assembly, I, I noticed like hmm, the compiler actually did not vectorize those two code, those two codes, like those two versions, those two Llama versions. And that's one of the one of the reasons why I also manually implemented all these layouts to just make sure that Llama is not doing something something weird here. And it actually turns out that Llama did something weird here. Because if we implement those layouts by hand, we can see that the array of structure array, it's still kind of garbage, but it's less garbage than the Llama version. But the array of structure array with 16 lanes, that's actually that actually performs how we would like to expect it. Because I expect it to be like similarly fast and destructive arrays. 
But since we like move the particles closer together in memory, let's say maybe that has some effect and maybe it makes it go like a few percent faster. So the array of structure array with 16 values inside, that's actually the one that achieves the, the, the speed up I was hoping for. On the Intel CPU, we can see a similar defective behavior with the Llama versions. Uh, and also similar behavior with the AOS or A8 and 16. The 16 version gives us the, the speed up I was hoping for, and also the version with the 8, it just, it just, it just doesn't perform. So here is a, a close-up benchmark again with the struct of array version and this, the area of struct of arrays with 16 lanes. So here we can like more easily see that there, that there is a little gap so that's like, I don't know, my wild guess is around 20%, 15%, something that, that we gained with, with this like more weirdly layout with this like one inner nesting of the blocks here. The speed up is also like slightly large on Intel cores. It's also something I noticed. So this is annoying. So what happened with this AOS or A thingy? So why, why did that perform so bad? And I looked at the assembly and I found out that the compiler failed to vectorize it. So like uh, even like the manually written version, the AOSOA with, with eight here, uh, the compiler did not vectorize it. And that was very surprising because why shouldn't it? You know, you could very easily uh, just use AVX2 instructions, compute on eight numbers of the same time and you're fine. I compiled with dash m arch native. So this asks the CPU, what do you support? My CPU supports AVX 512. So AVX 512 runs on 16 floats, but I'm giving the compiler only areas of eight floats. So this means like AVX is too large for the memory layout that I gave to the compiler. And that's my best guess why it didn't vectorize, but actually I don't know. Because when I tried to compile on the AMD CPU, which only supports AVX 2, so like here, the, the native instruction set of the CPU uh, is, has, has the right size as, as the, the blocking in the memory layout. Even then the compiler didn't do it. And when I explicitly forced the compiler and I told them, look here, I want you to generate AVX2 instructions. Like, like don't look at what your CPU has, just, just do AVX2 and FMA, just, just please do it. The compiler still couldn't vectorize the code. And that is very surprising and also very annoying because you would think that if you tell the compiler do AVX2, AVX2, so that means run on eight floats of the same time, and I'll give you this super nice layout that has eight floats at the same time, the compiler would still say, I can't do it. So, so that was very weird for me because for the version with the 16 floats, if I give you a layout with 16 floats and I tell you, yeah, please use instructions in 16 float, the compiler is super happy and does it. And yeah, so eventually what will happen is uh, for the AVX2 version with the, 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 the eight float blocks here, the compiler will just produce serial code. So this is why the performance is, is equally bad as the original uh, baseline version, the array of struct, because the compiler can't vectorize it. What happened with the Llama version? So, the Llama version that blocks with, with 16 floats, that should actually perform the same as the manually written version that blocks with 16 floats. Because here we have the same memory layouts and we run the same computation. So why can't the compiler vectorize the Llama version? So what's happening here? And as it turns out, the problem is the looping structure. And uh, I gave you the hint before when we had this array of struct of array, we had four nested loops because we had it to iterate over all the blocks and within the blocks, we had to iterate over all the lanes. So this is not how Llama's user interface works because in Llama, you always have a single index. You ask for the particle I and then Llama internally translates this in whatever the memory layout uh, needs. And the memory layout, this array of struct of array, it actually needs two level indexing but Llama outside only supports a one level indexing. So what Llama needs to do is it map, it needs to map between those two index spaces. So we need to map the index that runs from zero to problem size into an index that maps into the blocks. So we divide the index by the number of lanes. That, that's the block we need to get. And then we take the modulo of I and the lanes. That's like within the block, the lane we are trying to talk to. So Lama needs to do this computation. 
So every time we access one particle, Nama needs to do this remapping of the index space to know where to go to memory. So again, the memory layout is still the same, but the looping structure is a different one, and we need to transform between the two index spaces. That's the difference between the Llama version here and between the manually written version. And that includes this huge, huge, huge slowdown because that index transformation, it confuses the compiler. The compiler fails to reason on where the indices are going, how the loops are behaving, and the compiler gives up and can't vectorize the loops. So how could we work around this? And this is like one of the first to-dos that came out of here. Nama needs a different iteration mechanism. So just giving the user that uses Llama uh, an index-based uh, interface where we tell the user, you build your for loop and you give Llama an index and you iterate over your, your, your thingies by just telling you, give me uh, particle zero, particle one, particle two, and so forth. This construct is not powerful enough to, to like, generate the right code to the compiler so the compiler can understand what's going on and vectorize. So this is something that, that needs to change and improve in Llama because it's really a problem of the looping structure. Okay, here's a perf version. Um, what I was going to explain here. So that's the struct of every version. So that one, so that's like one of the faster versions. And then here is the version with the area of struct of every with 16 floats. And one of the differences I also noticed here is that in the struct of array, the struct of array version, you have this tight loop here that crunches on eight floats. So each iteration here crunches eight floats, jumps back the next eight floats, and so forth. And in the array of struct of array version, since we have four loops, and the two inner loops, they have 16 iterations. And the compiler knows this because we specified that this array of struct of array has 16 inner lanes. So like the loop count that the compiler sees is a compile time constant. So that's at first, um, the compiler sees how long the vectors are so it can vectorize. But secondly, it can also see, okay, you're doing 16 iterations. So maybe it's a good idea if I unroll the loop and like just copy place that inner loop 16 times after each other and use different registers for that. And we can see that because here we suddenly have YMM registers that go up to like register 23, 24. It uses far, far more registers here. So this also means the processor is now able to like compute on particle i and particle i plus one kind of at the same time because it can like start to parallelize over 16 particles with vector instructions. So we're actually parallelizing over 16 times 16 particles using the data level parallelism of your vector instructions, but also using a bit of instruction level parallelism because your CPU is capable of doing a few instructions at the same time because it has like multiple compute units inside. So we also benefit from instruction level parallelism here with this AOSOA version. That doesn't give you a lot, but it's something that I found out. So if you look at the caches here, um, there's also a little bit we can see here. If we look uh, at the, the yellow matrix that also like the loads from L1, they improved a little. So that's like one fifth of the loads. The, the, the load misses decreased by 50%. Yeah, and the last level cache loads are also kind of halvened. So you can see also like slight improvement here on the cache system. And overall we run, um, that's also uh, quite funny to see. We ran almost the same instructions. So we have 100, uh, 160 billion instructions here and here we have like 146 instructions, but we, we, we ran less than half the cycles. So that's quite funny because that means the CPU actually runs almost the same instructions, but it takes like half or a third of the time because it can just do more instructions at the same time. And then there's also something that we noticed here. If, if, we, if, we, if we go back here at the, at the area of struct of ARI 16 version, we can see we're using YMM registers here. But YMM registers are AVX2 and we packed 16 floats for the compilers and 16 floats would allow the compiler to use AVX 512 instructions and AVX 512 instructions, they use these so-called CMM register, very cool naming. So SSE started with XMM 
AVX2 then had the regist as YMM, and then AVX512 uh, now uses CMM as, as register names. I wonder what will happen if there's ever a new instruction set, like what the next letter of the C is. So although I passed dash M arch native to the compiler, I asked the compiler, look at the CPU. The CPU supports AVX512. The compiler still did not generate AVX512 uh, instructions. For some reason, I need to explicitly tell the compiler. I need to force the compiler to generate AVX512 and only then it generates those instructions here. And that was also weird. So even though I used dash M arch, the compiler did not respect all the instructions my CPU had. That gives you a speed up of like 1.019. So like that's like a 1% improvement. So nothing, nothing really fancy here to gain, but then you enjoy like cool AVX 5.12 magic. So AVX 5.12 comes with a bunch of new instructions that you have never seen in your life. Like the, you have this like super cool compare not equal whatever stuff that kind of computes something and puts it in a K1 register, which is something I've never seen in my life. So AVX 5.12, it comes with like separate masking registers and then you start computing masks and then you have like R square root instructions with 14 bits of precision that use a mask and in case uh, the values are not masked out, set them to zero. So what this code eventually actually does is like if it computes the R square root, but if the value is, let me think, if the value was, was it negative, then you can't take the root, was it? Or if it's zero, then you divide by zero. So it protects against one of those cases. And this is what it checks here. It checks if one of the inputs is one of those cases where R square root doesn't work sets the mask register and then just has some behavior where it just sets the values to zero if the computation would not be valid. So you get to enjoy the super nice things with, with AVX uh, 512. Finally, there is also a, an R square root 28 instruction the, that I found out. So that's an R square root that actually gives you super nice precision. But funny, it was only available in XE on Fine Knights Landing. So those people that know the Knights Landing, this was like a, an accelerator card that Intel produced that you could plug into your PC, much like a GPU, and it was supposed to be to be also used for accelerating your computation and do uh, lots of number crunching on it. And only this architecture had this instruction, and this instruction never made it into any desktop processors. So, so that's also a, a, a funny tale here, because people usually have the, the troubles that R square root is not precise enough. That's why we usually do this Newton Refson steps afterwards. So we had one CPU that actually fixed this by giving a better a better precision version, but then actually it was only in an architecture that was deprecated, and we no longer have this instruction. So yeah, that, that was kind of interesting to me. So another question we can ask is, so if this auto resector, if this auto vectorization fails like so often, so ve auto vectorization is fragile. So when we ask the compiler, please vectorize, or we just hope, we cross the fingers, we hope the compiler vectorizes. In many cases, it still can't do it. And, and if it can do it, maybe you just like change a little bit in your code and then your compiler all of a sudden fails to vectorize it again. So this is, this is brittle. So we can do it by hand. And this way we can make sure that it always vectorizes because if it would vectorize, you would get a compile error. But this is where things uh, get, uh, it actually gets uh, pretty gorgeous. So if, if you look at those versions here of the update and PP interactions, those use uh, AVX2 uh, instruction explicitly and it, it's just uh, mag magnificent code. Like it, it's so beautiful. Um, it also gives you a job guarantee. So if, if you if you manage to, to write this code and, and have it checked in into like a popular uh, software product in your company, you, you're going to have guaranteed job security because nobody can read that and nobody can maintain that. It's, it's just super, super, super gory code. Um, so all the fun aside, um, when you touch intrinsics, this is when you call functions from headers like IMM intrin. And those intrinsics, they're basically functions that just compile down to a single instruction. So I, I really need to manually manage like my broadcast instructions, my loads from memory, my stores to memory. Here on the right side, I have my sub instruction, the multiplication instruction. Here I have this R square root instruction. And I explicitly also need to write the fused multiply add instructions because 
When I touch these intrinsics, I need to do everything myself, but it will also result in the nice code if I am able to do this properly. So using those uh, intrinsics, it's kind of a gamble and it's a trade-off. You, you take a lot of time to write that. It's very uh, easy to make mistakes here. You create immensely unmaintainable code, but if you are lucky and you do this, you do this well, then you can get really good performing code. So that's the gamble you're taking here. And because touching these instructions is, is so nasty, there were people that wrote libraries on top of those, so-called Cindy libraries. And, and one of those libraries is VC. And I think some people have heard of VC before. It was uh, developed by, uh, by a person called Matthias Kretz, who works at GSI in, in Germany. And I think it was part of his PhD thesis, and he still continues to develop it further uh, until the last one or two years. It's a SIMD library, and what it tries to do is it hides those vector intrinsics that are so nasty. So like all those, those weird calls with the underscores, it hides this under a nice interface. So it gives you a class that's called a vector. And this vector, it represents your vector on the CPU. So if you have an AVX2 uh, CPU, then that's like a vector of, of eight. And you know, for the T parameter, you can plug in float here, and then you have a vector of eight floats if you are, if you compile for AVX2. And then this vector has nice arithmetic operators. You can do vector plus another vector, and that's going to generate this uh, vector add instruction, for example. There are a few overloaded mathematical functions like r square root, the absolute value, the sine, the logarithm, uh, min, and, and so forth. And you have scatter and getter functions. So scatter and getter is if you want to pull multiple values out of memory, and they are not blocked together, eight of them at the same time, but maybe like they're in different locations, but you want to like get them together into single register, you have some functions that support you in these scenarios. VC chooses a vector length based on your compiler flag. So if you compile for AVX2, VC will know that it will that that you want VC to generate AVX2 instructions. If you compile just for SSE, for example, which is vectors of four floats, then VC will generate those instructions. Unfortunately, VC doesn't support AVX512 yet. And it started to get a little out of date because Matthias Kretz, the main maintainer of VC, he doesn't have a lot of time lately, the last one or two years for, for VC. But it's still a very good library and I used it in, uh, in, the, in the subsequent codes. You can find it on GitHub, there's a link here at the bottom. So if you write this with VC, uh, this looks like this, which is much better. So this is still kind of a hand vectorized version, but it just reads much more nicely. And what we'll do here is we include the VC header and I'll just define a quick type alias. And I call this vec here. That's a VC vector of my floating point type. So essentially this is my float eight. So there's like eight float values in, in a vector register. Then I also have my lanes and my blocks. I use this array of struct of array layout. So I'll have like particle blocks and inside each block, there's one of these vectors. So inside each block, there is eight X, eight Y, eight C. And then again, of those eight times, we still have like this nested loop structure. Notice now that we only have three nested loops. So why is that? Previously, I needed the fourth nested loop to iterate like over the values in a single vector. But now because one of these VC vectors already holds eight values, I don't need the inner loop that iterates over those eight values again, because I can now express all the computations as running on the vectors. So here in PP interaction, I always deal with this vector type. So I have here this uh, position X of particle Y and I have position X of particle J and I just write the minus here. And since this is a VC vec, like this PI and PJ plus X and so forth, those are all VC vecs. These minus instructions will run eight minus operations conceptually and put the result into X distance. But since we see smart, it will generate a vector instruction here for this one minus that just runs eight computations in, in a single instruction. And this looks nice because now we can write multiplies, we can write pluses, we can call uh, functions like VC R square root. So VC comes with some of those mathematical functions and those will do the right code gain in the back. So how does this perform? Um, and we look at the very right here at the last two benchmarks. This is like the AVX2 handwritten version and the VC handwritten version. 
Whereas here on the left, we have the one where the compiler generated the AVX2 instructions. Notice that it's the AOSOA16, whereas my handwritten versions use AOSOA8. That's one of the minor difference. But the compiler generated version for the AOSOA8 just was so bad, I couldn't compare it with, with it. So here is the benchmark uh, if we look more closely at it. So we can see there is still a major performance gain uh, we, we can have here from not relying on the auto vectorizer, but just writing all the vector codes ourselves. And this was really large to me. And I figured like, wow, why, doesn't, why does the compiler do such a bad job at, at, at vectorizing those? I mean, the, the, there can't be so much more that we see can do here. Like, like what is going on? Because we can still see here from the AOSA 16 to the one where I use the AVX explicitly, that's like almost one quarter or one third of the performance uh, that, that I gained here. So something smelled a little fishy. So how do we find out what's going to happen? And, and the answer is, of course, we look at the assembly again. So we have like our loads from memory, broadcasts are broadcast instruction, by the way, is we load a single value and then blow it up to all the elements of the vector. So those broadcasts are also kind of memory loads here. We also have memory addresses here. So we do all the loads. We have subtraction, multiplication, and, and stuff. Here we have the R square root, multiplication, additions, blah, 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 a few multiplier adds, and those go back to memory. Okay, nicely. What do we have on the VC version? And I'll cut short here. We have the R square root instruction here, then only two multiplication, and then we do the fused multiply adds and go back to memory. But on the left side here, we have much more code that's executed after the R square root. So what's happening here? And I've told you before that this R square root is an imprecise instruction. So many compilers, when they generate this R square root instruction, they generate additional code that does a Newton Refson step to refine the result of the R square root, to, to just improve the precision of the result. And since we used in VC just the R square root function, so we just call R square root, what we see does, it just gives you the R square root. It just doesn't do anything fancy afterwards. And this is what we are missing out here. So what we basically measured in this benchmark is a version that was less precise because we omitted the, the, the newton refson step to refine the R square root. So this is actually a different, a different computation. It's a computation with far less precision. In some applications, that doesn't matter a lot because we are fine with reduced precision, but we just need to be aware that we traded away precision here for runtime performance. So what if we added that back? And the way you can add that back is by calling VC R square root, and then you implement the Newton Refson step yourself. And I wasn't smart enough to do that because my math lecture is a long time ago. So I Googled around on the internet and I looked into what GCC does. And this is the code that basically it, it does here. And uh, that adds an additional step of refinement here. So you have a few multiplications, you have a subtraction here and uh, two constants. And those then like improve the result of the initial call to R square root by a fair bit. And now we are on par again to what GCC generates. And we can see now that almost lifted us back to the initial version that GCC generated. So be mindful when you resort down to this like low level performance instructions that you might trade precision here for, for runtime performance. That, that's important to know. Okay, then here's a lot of code and I don't want to walk you through everything, but there, are, when it comes to vectorization of the N body specifically, there are two ways on how we can do that. Because vectorization means we want to run eight values at the same time. So in our PP interaction, we want to update eight particles by eight other particles. But if we only do eight particles with eight particles and then move on, we actually missed all the interaction, let's say like between the zero particle of the one vector between like the two, two uh, between the second or third particle of the other. So we we need to compute the interaction between eight and eight particles, and also all pairs in combination of this eight and eight. Uh, and there are two ways uh, we, we can do this. We can read one particle, blow it up, like re repeat it eight times, 
and then do vector calculation by updating eight particles by that one particle. Or we can read eight particles. Um, we, we can read eight particles, read one other particle, update that one other particle by all the eight others. But here with this version on the right, we have the problem now. We read the one particle, we update, we, we, we need to blow this particle up into eight copies, uh, compute the eight interactions with the other particles, and then we need to reduce those eight copies of the one particle back again. This is what the sum does. So we fetch this one particle, the velocity of the one particle, we blow it up into a vector, we compute the interactions, and then we reduce all these velocity changes back again into, into this one particle. So that's a different strategy for vectorization. And I just wanted to add it here for completeness, because I've seen that somewhere on the internet and I figured, yeah, well, maybe actually I should try that. The result was it turns out way worse than all the other examples. And the, the main reason why this is very slow and like just quickly tell you the benchmark here is like uh, the faster versions are the one where we uh, read one particle, update eight others with it, and we write eight particles back. And the slow versions is uh, we 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 read one particle, update. Let, wait, wait again. We read one particle, we blow it up into a vector, compute eight interactions, we reduce those updates back, and we write one update back to memory. So one of the ideas was that this version that turned out slower would reduce the amount of memory writebacks, but it turns out far, far slower consistently in all the measurements. So what happens here? And, and the main problem that, that happens here is uh, on the left side, we have the one version that updates eight particles and write eight, writes eight particles back to memory. And on the right, we update one particle but we need to blow it up to eight values and then reduce it back. And actually this reduce step is what costs the most of the time because the first part of the assembly is the same as, as at our fast version. But here on the bottom, and this is uh, quite a large uh, code block here. This is a so-called horizontal sum. And the horizontal sum is when you need to add up all the values in one of your vector registers. And it turns out there is no fast instruction for that. And this actually takes a lot of time, like just summing up all the values of your AVX registers, those, those eight floats that sit inside there, like adding them together, that, that's actually hard. And this is what we can see here. And this is what actually takes all the performance away, this reduction step. So again, the idea was, can I, save some writes to memory by like doing this computation locally, performing a super little reduction and then writing back to memory. And it turned out that this little reduction was an enormous amount of computational effort and it was just far better to just write back eight values and, and, and we're good. So, so that's the story here. Okay, here's a different one, uh, more iteration levels and I think I'm starting to walk a little faster now in my talk because I can see the, the time advancing and the, the further we go, the, the more weird this, these experiments get. So uh, basically the conclusion will be don't do it. So if we look at the memory hierarchies of our processors, and this is a, a very nice uh, GUI visualization of how your CPU looks like. Uh, thanks to Gilham for showing me this. I think I haven't, no, I have included the command on another slide. So there's a program called LS Topo, T-O-P-O, -O, that you can run. I think you need to install it first. And then it shows you like your, your layout of, of, of your CPU. And what you can see here in gray are the CPU cores, and then you can see up the cache hierarchies. So something we could think about is here, um, we only looked at like main memory where we store all our particles. And then on the core levels, we looked at the sizes of the vectors. But CPUs have like different blocking sizes all the way up the hierarchies. So we have like an L1 that has a certain size, we have an L2 that has a certain size and so forth. So what if we did this array of struct of array, like, like even further and we like just then blocked an L2 size and we blocked an L and L3 size. And we can actually do this. And, and, and this is, at this point, this is just going to get crazy because instead of uh, four nested loops, we now have six nested loops, and one of these nested loops is hid is hit again 
is hidden again inside those vector instructions of VC. So this is, by the way, again, a VC version. So that uses VC for vectorization. But now we try to like organize the loops in a way that like the loops iterate within the L1 cache, within the vector units. And then later we can add one more layer. So we can just like make fun here. And we just iterate, we build all the loops the way that the cache hierarchy works. And the sizes of how many like blocks we put into one L1 tile and how many L1 tiles. So L1 is like the level one cache, L2 is the level two cache. So how many level one cache tiles we put in, into those. We can kind of derive those from the sizes of our caches. And I put them to nice powers of two, so I don't need to write weird loops, but this is like roughly the amount of blocks that fit into L1. And this is like roughly the amount of L1 blocks that fit into my L2 cache. So pretty cool what happens if I execute that. And, and here's a quick benchmark. It actually turns out that it has like almost no effect on, on, on anything. If I would give you the very detailed numbers, there's like a 1% runtime improvement, but that could also be just noise. I ran uh, 10 times the program, I, I took the average. So there's like 1% that we could gain here, but it's like everything, everything I've seen here. So that was a nice idea, but it actually didn't change anything except that it made the program a lot more complicated. So, so that's the story here. And then there is a thing. So I wrote all those uh, CPU benchmarks a while back. And then at some point I decided I'll go over to GPUs and uh, I, I looked at the CUDA versions of the end body and I noticed those CUDA versions, they always do one thing different. And what those CUDA versions do is like, they always take the IF particle and put it in a local variable. And then they compute the interaction. So the inner loop here is the same as everything we did here before. So on the left side, those are the versions we usually did until now. And the right side is what I've seen in every CUDA tutorial. So in the CUDA tutorials, they always pull out this one particle into a local variable. They run the computations on this variable and then they put the one variable back to memory. So what can we reason about this here? So on the left side, we read and write to this particles i a lot of time. So like within this inner loop that just spins on J, so we always touch the same memory location, we spin on this memory location, we read to it, we write we, we write to it and, and back and forth. Okay, we, we actually do this a lot. So maybe we are doing unnecessary memory requests. But on the other hand, since we always touch the same memory location within the inner loop, that should stay in L1 cache. So maybe that's not such a big problem. Maybe we could argue we're not using any extra registers because that local variable on the right side would need some extra registers. So, so maybe that makes a difference. On the right side, this particle I here, it's just read once and written once in inside the outer loop. So we have less memory access. Okay. Um, but then this PI variable, it's one particle, it contains seven floats. So maybe this uses more registers, but hey, at least they're going to stay in registers. So we're not going to L1 back and forth. We, we, we are having our values stay in registers. So, okay, nicely, how, how does that look? And before I show you the, 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 the bench, benchmark, let's reiterate this on, on the assembly level. And I've, I've colored some of the registers here for you. And here at the top, uh, that's uh, the outer loop where we fetch the IF particle. So that's like the IF particle, the one we, we change on all the J particles. And I think red was the position and blue was the velocities. So we have those registers and then inside the inner loop, which starts here, we fetch the other positions, we run the computations, we compute uh, the final velocity update. And here we make the store to memory. So on the left version, we store those values back into memory. What do we have on the right version? So everything starts out the same, but the store back to memory, and I've marked the branches here with yellow. So the stores back to memory, the outside of the inner loop. So that's the major difference here. Here we store back to memory only once in the outer loop. So we move the stores outside the inner loop. Whereas on the left version, we have the stores inside the inner loop. So how much does that actually affect performance? And initially, um, what's initially? I'm, I'm showing you the benchmark here for the AOS. 
It also has effects on the on the other runs as well, which I'm going to show you later. But that's quite a difference for something that that seems very insignificant. You know, you you look at the code, you you feel like I'm I'm just touching this particle i, it's the same memory location all the time. Yeah, I, I'm having CPU caches, and here I just create a, a just a, a stupid local variable. But as, as we can see here, that has a quite profound impact. So the impact is a little different between uh, the AMD and the Intel core, but there's still a very measurable uh, speed difference between whether to use that stupid local variable or not. And this is even more profound if we uh, look at the perf counters, so you can uh, do perf stat again, but perf can measure more than just like a few metrics. So you can actually run perf list and it gives you a, a list of a gazillion performance, count, performance counters that you can measure, measure. And you can turn those specifically on with like the dash E that stands for event. And you can list events that you want perf to measure. And I wanted to specifically measure stores to the L1 cache and stores to the, the last level cache here. And we can see here the difference is just enormous. So the amount of caches we did to L1, because in every loop inter iteration, we stored back to L1 and we loaded back from L1. So we had like 130 billion stores to the cache. Whereas when we use the local variable, that just drops by what, like a factor of 500. So there's like a 500 X reduction of, of, of pressure that we put on the L1 cache with just this stupid variable. I was surprised that it didn't change the runtime performance much more, but it's still something like very important what we observed here is that uh, try to avoid unnecessary stores back to memory. So like if you continue to like crunch on a value or like uh, reduce something on a value, like make sure that that's a local variable. So I implemented this local variable for many of the other versions. And then I hit the very interesting question. Because in those in those versions where I have this super enormous tiling, so I iterate over like the sizes of the L1 cache and over all the blocks and within the blocks in the lanes, you have a lot of places where you could actually do this local variable. I could move it like very much outside. I could have it in one of the inner loops and then like write back that occasionally. Because also one of the problems, the loop structure here is that we iterate over all the I blocks and then over all the J blocks and the I tiles and the J tiles. But if we want to keep the reduction variable for the I particle in the register for as long as possible, we would need to change the looping structure here and just do everything on I in the outer loops and everything on J in the inner loops. And that also kind of ruins performance. So eventually what I ended up with, I tested various combinations of those, like swapping the loops, placing the reduction variable in different places. It turned out that that's kind of like just a 1% difference. So, so there's not much to gain here from putting the, the variables somewhere else. So here is a complete the benchmark. And in, in pink, you have all the runs that just always write back to memory and in green, you have the runs that use this local variable. And we can see here that for the Llama versions, this seems to have a more prominent uh, effect. We can also see the AOSOA with eight where the compiler just horribly failed to vectorize it. Like this local variable could mitigate a lot, a lot of the performance losses, but also for the very fast runs where we used vector instructions ourselves, it actually did not change the runtime. Actually, it made it like 1% slower, roughly. So that that's like the result here. So whenever possible, like just avoid writing back to, to, to memory and writing back to caches. Try to keep your reductions in local variables. Here's the same benchmark on an Intel core. And if we compare those with each other, we can see there is a, like in some of the benchmarks, there's a, a rough difference. So for the Llama AOS so A with eight and 16, we can see that on the Intel core, we are on the Intel core now, the, the mitigation of the bad performance with the local variable is much more profound than, than on the AMD. But overall, like everywhere we get a little speed up except for like the hand uh, vectorized versions where I think we are already at the maximum what's what's possible. Okay, so this is like most of the stories I wanted to tell you.
so here's a little bit more bonus uh, material that uh, I've also discovered over time and that's kind of like a little outside or it kind of like touches the topic a little, but it, it's kind of bonus material. So a while back, uh, I made a super interesting observation and um, I've shown you the struct of array versions. So we had like those seven buffers where we placed all the X values, all the Y values, each in a separate buffer. So the, the idea was what happens if I change the alignment of that buffer? And this is something uh, I think uh, Yuchi and me noticed in summer. And I've talked about this already, I think at, what was it? We had like this data parallel workshop and I just brought up one slide on this and I took some more time to investigate this. So what the measurement is here is basically, we have an struct of array version and a struct of array version that uses multiple buffers. And the, the pink line is the, the normal area of struct, that's the baseline version. And just the placement of your buffers in memory there is a, a property called alignment. And alignment means the start of this buffer is on a multiple of an address. So if I have, and those are various alignment values here on, on, the, on the X axis. So if, if I have an alignment of 64, that means the buffer when I allocate it, it starts on an address that is a multiple of 64. So why is this important? The way the hardware works, the memory system of the CPU, when it when it pulls out a bunch of data from memory into the CPU, it usually loads a cache line. And it likes to load cache lines that are on multiples of addresses of the size of the cache line. So if, if, your, if your cache line sits on an address that's a multiple of 64, that's perfect. Then it can just pull in the cache line. If your cache line is not on a multiple of 64, your CPU actually does two fetches because like the cache line spawns two 64 byte ranges. It does the two fetches and, and realigns this in memory. So newer Intel processors have like uh, are more powerful with uh, with this mitigation, so they can do unaligned accesses in a better way and so forth. But anyway, alignment means the multiple of the address where I place the buffer. And what can we notice here? So if I align on like one, so like the alignment is just, just place the buffer anywhere, don't regard any alignment. We have certain performance characteristics. So what we, what we see here on the Y axis is the runtime performance of a call to update of the end body. And when we increase alignment, we can see here at 32, we suddenly start to gain some speed. And the 32 here where we gain the speed is because 32 bytes is the size of the AVX2 vectors. So the moment, like all the values are aligned at 32, at, at a multiple of 32, we see some speed up because now the vectors sit on nice addresses in memory. And then it just goes on and stays the same. And there's an interesting observation between the two CPUs. So on the left, we have the AMD, on the right, there's the Intel core. And on the AMD CPU, after an alignment of 32, where we can use AVX instructions, nothing really changes unless we align so, so, so much. And I, I'll add it here, this L3. So this is the size of the L3 cache. So if we make the alignment as large as the L3 cache, and this also means we have a buffer and the next buffer is far, far away because it needs to be on a multiple of an address that's a huge value. We can see a dramatic performance loss. So this also kind of suggests that if those buffers move really, really far apart in memory and they move further apart as L3 is big, you will suffer a really, really, really bad performance hit. But what's even more weird is Intel. So in Intel, we also, when we reach this uh, 32 value where the memory is aligned um, with the AVX2 registers, we have a, a large performance gain. But then it becomes weird. And notice that the, the green and the blue version here. The green version is just one single allocation and the blue version is I have separate buffers, which are all nicely aligned. We can see that the Intel CPU actually gets faster than at around 1024. It, it gets even more faster if we over align these buffers compared to just having one buffer. And then when we leave L2, we actually get slower again. And, and we actually catch up to the 
to, to the baseline struct of every version. And also for Intel CPUs, if the buffers are, uh, are further apart than the L3 cache, this is no performance penalty. That's also quite interesting. So if the buffers are further apart than L3, that's a problem for AMD CPUs. And for Intel cores, this actually doesn't matter. Okay, so I tried to investigate this and, and that took me an awful lot of time. And to be honest, uh, I didn't figure out anything much. So I, here are the, the perf stat counters. I didn't highlight anything because they're actually almost the same. So I couldn't see anything here from the metrics on the caches and so forth. So I tried a different tool and uh, some people might have heard of Valgrind. So Valgrind is usually used to uh, run your program in like a special mode where it uh, tries to detect uh, memory access array uh, arrows, like out of bound area accesses and so forth. There's also a cool tool called cache grind. And that very, very precisely looks at how often does your program miss caches, uh, um, does, uh, does access uh, the L1 cache, the last level cache and so forth. So this is like similar to what perf does, but well grind, uh, the, the cache grind tool, it can be a little bit more precise. But also here there's nothing really much interesting that, that I observed. So I did perf and uh, I perfed the two versions and uh, I'm going to take it uh, away from you. Uh, it's everything the same instructions. So it, it, it's virtually, it, it's the identical code. It's identical instructions that, that I ran here. But we can see that there's somehow a performance difference because here on the right side, like there are more instructions colored with like, there is some amount of work here. Whereas on the left side, we have lots of instructions that, I don't know, just come for almost for free. And then we have some instructions that just take, take a lot of time. So there's like a difference in the amount of on which, on which instructions time is spent, but also not something that can give me a clue here. So there's another profiler that's called VTune and that one comes from Intel and it comes with a nice GUI and it can do super, super cool stuff. And there is a feature called a micro architecture exploration. And it looks into like various performance characteristics of your CPU itself on like uh, how the instructions flow through it and where they get stalled and so forth. And, and this picture here that it gives you, it kind of shows you a pipeline and green is everything that just moves nicely through the pipeline. And red is everything that's kind of starting to stall in this pipeline because it's blocked here by this bottleneck. So this, this is what it shows you here. So is the red instructions are instructions that the CPU tried to do, but they kind of stalled here, they were blocked here, they couldn't finish in time because something was blocking them. So we can see overall, like both versions are kind of blocked similarly, but the slower version is blocked a little bit more. And if we look into this performance metrics, we can see here that the right version, the slower version, the, the one with, that's by the way, an alignment of 65,000 uh, bytes. Um, that version was blocked by memory access. So 5% of the time instructions were blocked by memory boundness. Okay, so that was like the first clue I ever had. So like the slower versions, like something's wrong with the memory access behavior. We could have guessed that because we're playing with the memory alignment, but, but here's like the first piece of proof that something is with the memory. The sad story is I, I could still not figure out what, what happened, what, what, what really happened. Um, by the way, since I see it here on the right version, we can also see here cycles of zero ports utilized. That's also a metric that shows you how often none of the CPU execution ports uh, were, were occupied because the CPU really couldn't do any instructions because everything was waiting on memory. So that also happened 5% of the time on the right side and it happened never on the left side. So on the left side, the CPU always had something to do. And on the right side, in 5% of the cases, the CPU had to wait and couldn't do anything. So maybe that's like a little advertisement for this tool. I think it, it's really cool. But in this specific case, it, it couldn't give me much clues. So I resorted to something else and I'm, I'm going to, to speed it up a little bit. I, I printed out where those blocks actually, which memory access addresses those blobs reside in memory and what the gaps are in between. And the observation was with the fast version, those blobs have two kilobytes of gaps in between them. Whereas in the slower versions, those had very different gaps. So like, like the gaps between 
two of the chunks was larger than the gaps between others. And super surprisingly, between two of those buffers, there was a gap of 31 terabyte. And I was really, uh, I, I looked at that number and I figured, what the hell is going on? That machine has 32 gigs of, uh, of memory. How is that possible? So you might know that, uh, that, that uh, computers have virtual memory. So virtual memory means the addresses we get in our programs, they're much larger than the actual memory. So that's why such a value is possible. But it was interesting to see that the blocks, they are like, like put more randomly into memory. So I went along and like printed those gaps and distances of all the values. And I think this is like the best clue I, I kind of had. Because initially, when you ask for an alignment of one, two, four, and so forth, malloc, when you call it, so like the C run times malloc, it aligns at 16 bytes. So like that's kind of like the base alignment the operating system does for you. At 32, we reach uh, the alignment of the AVX instructions. So that, sh that, that should explain why we suddenly got faster here with an alignment of 32. And then uh, we have like gaps that are mostly homogeneously for a few exceptions, but surprisingly and funnily, where the runs start to get fast. So like alignment 5012, alignment 1024, that's kind of also where the memory, uh, the memory allocator of your operating system just places those buffers at exactly the same distance from each other. So the distances between the buffers is, is always uh, 512 bytes. It's always the same here. And if we continue further, it stays to be always the same until we reach this uh, 64,000. And that's exactly where the performance drops again. And this is honestly my best guess that I have here is that it's the placement of the buffers in memory, the memory addresses, those buffers reside. If they like, have like those nice gaps after each other, the CPU is somehow better capable of, of doing those memory accesses. I know this is very vague, but it took me like already a full day to find everything, like all of this out. And I'm, I'm honestly, I'm tired of this. It just gives me nightmares why this happens. So here are the observations. The minimum gap uh, for, for the alignment was, was 16 bytes when you allocate. Uh, it seems that if the blobs have uniform distance, it runs a bit faster. When the alignment is larger than the blob size or your L1 cache, then it starts to run slower. Way to go. What is blob size? I don't remember. I wanted to say something here. I, I can't remember. So all conclusions here are kind of weakish because nothing is really proven here, but it's it's my best get. If you really want to get to the bottom of it, I think you need to start writing your own custom memory allocate and just control every address where each blob is is, is positioned and just, just measure everything. I, I think there is nothing else I, I can do here. And as I said, I have spent enough time on this. I will let it go now. You, will, you won't hear from, from this weird effect anymore. It's like, I want to, I want to sleep better again. And then as it always happens, you know, it's like one day before you talk uh, and, and you do your happy little measurements and you, 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 write, you write your charts and whatever, and then, then you discover something and then you just start to question the entire universe and, and you spend an entire day. And, and so what happens? Uh, I dug up uh, an old N-body version that I had for these alignment tests and I saw the loop structure and a loop structure that we have used everywhere. It loops outside with i, it loops inside with j, it always updates the i particle based on the j particle. But in the version I dug up, it always updated the j particle from the i particle. And I looked at that and figured like, yeah, that, that must be a mistake, you know? That's, uh, that, that was my first thought. This is wrong. I always call PP interaction with the i particle and then with the j. So I changed it. And then I looked at it and thought like, what if this isn't wrong? What, what, what if somebody thought about this? You know, why, why they swapped I and J here? What, what, if this makes, what if this makes a difference? Maybe I should just do one quick test run to, to ensure that, that it's surely the wrong version. So that's what I did yesterday. And this is what came out. And it came out that the older version was twice as fast as, as, as what I've, like, like everything I've used in all my entire slides, it was just, it was just twice as slow. And and I, I was so frustrated yesterday. I figured like, man, I'm going to postpone the talk because everything is wrong here. <laughs> and they, 
the conclusion I had was like, man, I was using the I was using the wrong loop order for for the last two months. So everything I I, I did is just it's just plain wrong. So I started to redo like all the code and and everything. I started to produce new charts. And then I rendered out this this chart I I, I called canoe plot and I, I I compared the update as we so pink is the one that we have used everywhere in the presentation and the green one is the one that I discovered yesterday. But this chart now tells me that the version I discovered yesterday everything is slower except for this one case here. So actually I did the right thing for the last two months, but then what happened yesterday? So why was that twice as fast all of a sudden? And it turned out that if you spend too much time on the problem, at some point you just you just get blind. You don't, you don't see anymore what you're actually doing. And, and what happened is that it really turns out that if your buffers are aligned on an address that's a multiple of two kilobytes, yes, the versions I've shown you in this presentation actually run slower. But if we align at 64 bytes, which is a reasonable thing to do, which is the normal thing to do, because 64 bytes is like your cache lines, it's AVX 512 registers, this is, this is the code that you should have, then that actually still runs faster than what I found yesterday. So, so I, I, was, I was happy again, but it just took the whole day to figure that out. You know, it's like one of those days where I figured like, man, the whole day was wasted and you, you've lost all your nerves. So that's that. Quick words on multi-threading. Multi-threading was not the goal of this talk. It's also not the goal of, I think, uh, my PhD thesis. It's not. It's not like the core. So I'm looking mostly on, on memory layout and how how it impacts uh, runtime. But multi-threading at some point it it plays a part. You know, all the examples we've seen so far, they are single-threaded. But I just want to make sure that the optimizations we did, so everything we tried here, also runs nicely when we then add some more threads. And here's an opinion from myself, uh, because this slide was uh, very blank, and I figured I'm, I'm going to share this with you. I think some programmers throw more threads at slow code to achieve speed up, and I think programmers do that too early. So you see a performance bottleneck in your code and you think like, yeah, we need to, we need to add more threads. We need to parallelize it so, so it runs faster. So that works usually, but the code is still slow. And one of the problems is if your programs get multi-threaded, profiling and optimizing them gets harder because you have more threads. There's maybe even some thread interaction and that just makes, makes profiling and optimization hard. So like my little recommendation is here, like maybe try to improve single thread performance first because single threaded programs are easier to handle, but you still should and you still can, but you should parallelize your program later and use all your machine. Because if you don't parallelize, you waste a lot of your cores that you have that, that are idling. So you should definitely parallelize, but maybe try to, to find single thread optimizations first because it's easier to do them now than later when the program is parallel. So if we parallelize, uh, how does that work? And I've just taken the fastest versions we developed, which is the array of struct of array with uh, eight lanes that uses the VC that writes to eight particles and reads one with one thread. And then I just do two threads, four threads, eight threads, and so forth. And we can see that the, the speed up is, is super nicely. So it just doubles up, doubles up, doubles up. So that's like linear speed up, very nice. Like, uh, that, that's great. But something happens here with 16 cores, like, uh, oh my God, what's happening here? And that's why I added here again, the, the, the architecture of my CPU. Here's the command, by, whoops, here's the command, by the way, it's LS topo. And you can add this no factorize flags because then it gives you like all those cores individually. Otherwise it, it just adds some, some dots and says like from core to core eight and add some dot, dot, dot in between. We can see that there's kind of like two blocks in here and like, like they're like two groups of those cores. And that's actually this, the design of those AMD CPUs. They're kind of like, like two, two independent CPUs, but kind of put together on a, on a single die, so, so to speak. And what the problem we have here is the moment we leave one of those like, like sub, uh, sub, sub CPUs, and we start to utilize both of them. There's a lot of crosstalk between those because on all the memory accesses, like those cores, they need to like talk to each other. 
And there's various reasons for that that I, I won't go into detail, but here we, that's why we see the performance drop here because uh, we, get, we get a penalty from the architecture of our CPU. This is something we don't observe on the Intel core because the Intel core just has like one of those uh, core packages. And um, that CPU, by the way, has hyper-threading turned on or uh, simultaneous multi-threading as AMD calls it. So we actually have two PUs, two processing units here on, on each of the cores. But usually hyper-threading, uh, so like those two virtual cores, they're not as good as real cores. So that's why we can see super nice linear speed up until we reach the eight cores. And then for the like switching to 16 virtual cores, like with the hyper-threading, like we, we gain just a very, very tiny amount. But everything here before scales nicely. So great, that means all the optimizations we did, they work equally well in multi-threaded environments. So that's good, that, that's good. Okay, very great. It's 11.50, uh, CPUs were half the story. So it's time to talk about GPUs, is it? And GPUs is a whole nother universe. So here is the other half of the talk. And it turns out that talk turned out quite longer than I had anticipated. And it took far longer than I, had, than I wanted the talk uh, to prepare. I started a week ago and I barely could finish yesterday. So there's a, a lot of information already, to, already here. So that's why I would like to postpone everything GPU related to, to a different talk. Also because I was really lucky and uh, some people have heard that there are student projects at the Technical University Dresden and those student projects uh, are from a GPU lecture and uh, we were supposed to like give them like some interesting challenges to, to prove the skills. And I got one of the student projects and I proposed exactly, exactly my, what I did in the talk. So I gave the students an N-body version exactly the ones uh, we've seen on the slides, like the baseline AOS and destructive array versions. I gave it to the student and I told them, port this to CUDA and then play with all the memory layouts, write a shared memory version, play with memory layouts in the shared memory, do all the benchmarks for me so I don't have to do any work. So that, so that was the idea. No, I'm kidding. But the student uh, project really exists and I'm very interested in what the students will find out. I will do my own experiments on the side and I hope, I hope we get some really interesting results and we will talk about those uh, at some point in the future. Yeah, I think my cat gets nervous because she wants out. Quick words about status of Llama. We've seen in, uh, in the benchmarks here and I, I changed the order here of the benchmarks that like the Llama AOS versions compared to the manual AOS versions, like performance is on par. So Llama AOS seems to work. The Llama struct of every when we use multiple buffers, that's like as good as the handwritten one. So that, that works nicely as well. The Llama area struct of arrays version is, I don't know, bad, but the handwritten one was bad as well. The AOSOA with 16 lanes, compiler vectorized that nicely, that worked. The Llama version is just complete garbage. So overall, there's still a lot of stuff to do for the AOSOA in Llama. There is still something I need to improve so that Llama produces equally nice code as the manual and handwritten ones. And I think the key here is the loop structures and the index spaces of the iterations. And for reference here, that's the fastest run I could achieve on, on the right. That's like the VC version with AOS and, and so forth. Okay, I think that's a summary of, of, of what I just said. The AOS still needs work. Um, yeah, and Llama only provides you with data layouts and memory access. So still the way you need to express your computations on top of Llama, that's still not something I have looked a lot, a lot at. So we can use VC to explicitly uh, generate vectorized code on top of Llama, but there is, that's no good solution. And uh, I know uh, Jan Stefan um, at some point would like to also look into this on how you could like write kernels and maybe also like define a little uh, embedded, uh, embedded language inside C++ and how to express computations. So those can be nicely vectorized. So Llama is one piece in the whole picture, but there are still other pieces uh, around Llama. Conclusions. Know your code. So I think that's like uh, very, very important that you always measure. And I've showed you a variety of tools during the code, uh, uh, during the presentation, there was perf record and perf report that shows you the assembly and does some, some, some sampling. 
if you want a perf record with source code, so that perf shows you the C++ code, then you need to compile with dash G and def, uh, dash F no omit frame pointer, because then perf can, uh, they, it can map between the instructions and the code those instructions are generated from. There's perf list that shows you hardware performance counter that you can measure, perf stat gives you those counters. There's the dash DD for some detailed counters, so that's usually a safe bet. On there's dash E where you can customize all the counters. There's cache grind, which is a tool of Velg grind. There's Intel VTune, which is a nice GUI profiler from Intel, very powerful. It's free. I think it used to be proprietary and paid in the past at some point. I, I wasn't sure, maybe I was just misguided, but it's definitely free now and it's part of the One API SDK. So if you have heard about One API, that's like a version of Sickle that Intel implemented, and it's promoting this product recently. It's, it's part of this SDK. Have a glance at the assembly from time to time. It reveals you what the machine is truly doing and uh, like what your code is truly turning into. If you don't want to run a perf session, you can call a utility called opstump and you can call opstump dash D for this assembly with your executable and then you can pipe it into C++ filled because that demangles those weird function names that the compiler generates and gives you the nice C++ names that you see in your source code. Some commands have this dash M intel that changes the way the assembly is printed. So by default, most of this code show you a GNU style assembly. I prefer the uh, intel style assembly. That's something you can switch here. And make use of this godbold.org website. This is Compiler Explorer, which I've shown you in the very beginning. And that also lets you play with C++ code on the left and it shows you the generated assembly on the right. On memory layouts, we've seen this uh, struct of array and the uh, uh, array, uh, what was it? Uh, struct of arrays is the one in the middle and array of struct on the top. So the struct of arrays, the one in the middle tends to perform faster in, in all cases, mostly because it allows vectorization. This AOSOA is an interesting hybrid. It's usually a bit faster than the, than the SOA. It also turned out that in the struct of arrays, so the middle one, if you allocate each of those attributes into a separate buffer, that turned out to be better in Llama. I still don't know exactly why it's happened. So that investigation is still pending, pending, but it turns out that that was better. For the size of this AOSOA, like eight or 16 seems a reasonable choice. Just make sure your compiler generates the appropriate instructions. For registers and cache, uh, avoid repeatedly touching the memory when you can work in registers. So like don't just like ban, bang the same location in L1 constantly, like, like put it into a local variable. And here's a little thinking that, that, that I uh, employed for myself is like, uh, Scalers, like floats, ins, they, they sit in registers. If I have a struct, a local struct variable, that's a bunch of registers. If I have areas of dynamic storage or areas that have more than a few elements, this is always memory. So if you look at, the, at, at your program and you can see you're accessing areas, that means you're accessing memory. But if you have like local variables that are scalars or little structs, those are registers. So this is a way on how you can see where the registers, where is the memory in your program. And if you transfer from area elements to local uh, variables, that's usually a transfer from memory or cache into your registers and vice versa, you go from registers to memory cache. And we found out registers are faster than cache. So even though the L1 cache is pretty fast, if we use registers to, to work on our values, that still gives us uh, an edge that's still faster. So usually I've, I've heard about numbers of factor three to five that register access is faster than, than, the, than the L1 cache. On the side, uh, the initial parallel implementation I did to just measure the multi-threading performance used to C++ 7 in parallel SDL. That worked flawlessly on Windows. It gave me troubles on Linux with GCC and lib standard C++, so eventually I switched to OpenMP. That worked uh, better. When you run multi-threaded programs, pin your threads. So there's like environment variables to do this and so forth. So this means like your threads cannot change cores while the program is running. So your threads, when they're created, they stay at the same core always. That, that gives you some performance. What we did not cover was uh, hierarchical n-body schemes. So there are various algorithms that uh, use a more elaborated data structures. So for example, if you have uh, many bodies that are very close together, you can approximate those bodies by just like one super body. 
and, and that reduces the number of pairwise interaction. There's also something called Greenguard's fast multipole method. Um, and we didn't look at those. So those are different ways, but those change the algorithm. So those again, trade uh, precision with, with performance. My hint, um, yeah, my hint is uh, benchmark and profile everything, but I didn't have the time to profile for everything because there are just so many combinations of different uh, cache aware loop tiling, different uh, placements of the accumulator variables. I could basically swap around every loop that you've seen in this program. Sometimes this makes a huge difference. So I couldn't do everything. So, but I also won't do everything because I'm not a madman, but there is a lot you, you could still try. And what we also haven't looked at was, was, was AVX 512 because uh, VC doesn't support it. So I don't have the SIM library for it. And I didn't wrote an intrinsic version for it. So that's it. I'm, I'm incredibly surprised it's exactly 12 o'clock. I, I, I wouldn't have thought that this was possible. Um, you can find all code on GitHub here. There's like one CPP file that contains like all the various versions. And I myself, I'm exhausted the last few weeks. So I was looking at those end bodies for, for two months. That was very exhausting. I'm really hoping I can move on now to like do something different in, in, in my PhD, focus something else. But before that, I need some vacation and I wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Enjoy your Christmas vacations. Uh, thank you for spending those last two hours with me. Thank you very much. 